Okay. Let, let, let me, let's call the uh, the Finance Committee to order for the month of uh, July in 2022. In my town board that I'm the chair of the planning board, we uh, say the Pledge of Allegiance first, but uh, we're not going to do that here because that's not what we do yet. But maybe one of these days we'll do that. All right. So, uh, Mark, any public speakers, please? Yes, we have two public speakers. The first speaker is Lisa Daglian. Thank you. Um, hi, my name is Lisa Dagley, and I'm the Executive Director of the Permanent Citizens Advisory Committee to the MTA, or PCAC. The, the ominous weather is an appropriate backdrop for this discussion of the MTA's future financial situation. Lower than expected ridership return, leading to lower than anticipated fare box revenue, combined with the effects of the current economic situation and appropriate actions the MTA will take, mean that federal COVID relief funding will run out faster than expected. Soon very soon, we'll be looking at the, fi at the latest fiscal cliff, or tsunami if you prefer, with the MTA's only real options to raise, fare, cuts, raise fares, cut service, or lay off workforce. None of those are okay. It's time to treat transit as the essential service it is. That means working together and with our elected officials to find new, dedicated operating revenue streams, and we need to start now. Lurching from crisis to crisis year after year is exhausting for all of us, and we need stability in order to get riders back on board now and into the future. In addition to identifying new funding, it's critical to identify operating efficiencies, but we hope you'll learn from the past. Be cautious. Don't implement things like a blanket hiring freeze that will affect service and staffing levels for years to come. At this point, lessons learned from transformation should still be fresh and some likely still, st st still sting. So please don't repeat that, the same errors. Millions of riders rely on subways, buses, Long Island Railroad, and Metro North, and we need a strong and viable MTA that's financially stable. The world has changed. We're looking at a new paradigm of the way people work and travel. It's time for a new funding paradigm, too. More frequent and reliable service, which survey says riders want, requires funding. We're committed to working with you on this critical issue. We've launched a successful campaign to get congestion pricing passed, and we can do the same to see new dedicated operating revenue become reality. Thank you. Thank you. The second and final speaker is Jason Anthony. Thank you, Mark. Hey, Neil. Nice to see you. And nice to see uh, so many faces that I haven't seen in so many uh, years. Uh, Jason Anthony from Amazon Labor Union. Like uh, Lisa Daglian said, we don't want to see the 2010 uh, massacre, like I always say. Uh, we don't want to see another fiscal cliff so this is why we want to bring more ridership to our beloved system recently i was in chicago chicago is one of those places that they have this there are weekly there are unlimited passes they have it, get this folks, half off. For example, their one day pass, they have it for $5. One day pass, we don't have it here in New York City anymore. And cities like LA, they have their weekly passes. Get this, Jerry. Uh, you can write their uh, system for $10 the whole weekend. This is something that we could implement in Long Island Railroad and Metro North. So we, could, we, we should think outside the box to bring more riders to our system, but at the same time, avoiding a fiscal cliff. But at the same time, making not making mistakes and avoiding an epic fail 
So I'll see you guys Wednesday inside Amazon JFK in Staten Island. That's it. All right. Thanks, Mark. Okay. Uh, perfunctory action. Let's uh, vote on the minutes of uh, June twenty uh, seventh. Can I have a motion to approve those minutes, please? So moved. Second. Second. Any additions, deletions, corrections, sir? One little correction on page seven uh, under July financial plan. It says brief overview of what board members should expect. It should be members. That's the only correction. Okay. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Okay. Motion passes. Great. Thank you. Uh, a couple brief comments uh, before I turn it over to Kevin. So, first thing is this is an important meeting. Um, we're going to receive a presentation on the July plan. And I think for at least this calendar year, maybe for the next couple, it's uh, one of the more important presentations we're going to have. Uh, we all have a sense of what's coming. Uh, our chair has telescoped it. Our CFO has. Our state controller has uh, written about it prolifically recently. Uh, and we all have a sense of it. The ridership is down from pre-pandemic levels. There are a lot of points of light around the weekends and in many neighborhoods, but it is enough because our costs are not down the same. Simple, simple arithmetic, but we'll hear the details of that. Um, this is an information meeting, so I'd say it's important for the health of this organization, but we're not taking any vote today on that topic at least. Um, it is a tough meeting in what we're going to hear, but it is not the act of any omission or commission. It is in many ways, and I, I'm not one to generally say this, but this has happened to the MTA like many organizations around the, the country. We've been fortunate to have the support of the governor and our electeds in Washington and locally, but this is something we will have to solve nonetheless. Um, it's a busy meeting. We have this presentation. We have 10 procurements, five real estate actions. Uh, so we... Uh, we have a chance to engage. We're going to ask questions, but this is not going to be your only bite at the apple, so to speak. Wednesday, uh, Kevin's going to repeat the presentation on the July plan. Um, so we're going to give basically 45 minutes or so, maybe 50 for Kevin in this discussion, and then the remainder of the procurements. And the last to ask is we're going to, this is going to be a long meeting. I'm going to ask for an extra half hour to go to four o'clock um, because we just have a lot of actions to do. You also notice I rejigger the agenda a little bit. We're going to do real estate first instead of the procurements just to make sure we get some important work done. So with, with that, I want to thank our CFO for taking on this duty. It's how many months you've been in this job? Uh, a little over five. Wow. All right. Well, that's a, that's a fun five months. Thank God you've got an amazing staff uh, helping you through it. So uh, over to you, Kevin. Okay. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, good to see you. Uh, we're gonna, I'm going to walk through the July financial plan presentation again for new board members. The purpose of the July financial plan is really a mid-year update. So the February plan, which reflected the budget that was approved by the board in December, we now update in, in July and show a preliminary 2023 budget. Uh, really to, again, as, as Neil said, there's going to be no action either asked from the committee or the board. It's really early information that allows stakeholders and the public to comment and think about it as we move into the budget cycle, which will be the November plan, which will have the actual proposed budget for 2023. Um, uh, this this gives a, a lead in. So let's let's get get to it. So uh, what I want to first do is recap where we left off in February, and then we'll get into into the July plan. So if you remember, in February we were projecting that the federal COVID relief funds were going to be enough to cover operating deficits through 2025. We had a small piece of deficit financing assumed in 25. That was since replaced by some additional COVID relief. So where we were based on prior ridership covered by federal relief through 2025. The ridership forecast was based on the McKinsey midpoint that came from November 2020. The midpoint being McKinsey did two different scenarios, kind of a high case and a low case. And if you turn back, November 2020 was actually before the rollout of the vaccines. And a lot of the driving factors in the previous mid, uh, McKinsey analysis was, you know, what was going to be the 
length of the pandemic, when we're we going to achieve herd immunity, when were the, the vaccines going to be, be effective. We also had in the February financial plan regular biennial 4% uh, fare and toll increases in 23 and 25, standard, standard assumption. The 2021 fare increase was canceled. It was first postponed to 22 and then canceled thanks to additional state appropriations. But as you remember, Bridge and Tunnel, there was a toll increase of 6% in 2021. The, uh, based on the February plan, the fiscal cliff was expected to occur in 2026 with, all, with federal COVID relief sufficient to cover us through 25, and we projected a $2 billion plus deficit after the federal aid was, was fully exhausted. Again, that fiscal cliff was based on a, a new normal ridership based on the previous projections out in the horizon of achieving 88% of 2019 levels. But um, again, because of that, less than 100% of 2019 and growth in expenses, both on the labor and other expenses compared to historical fare increases added to the projected deficit. So that's where we were in February. And so let's see where we are now. So the, the biggest change in the July financial plan was a reforecast, which we've talked about, of our ridership recovery based on updated factors by McKinsey. We also did re-estimate agency expense budgets and debt service projections based on um, you know, current year to date and, and, and new projections going out. There were really no material changes in state dedicated revenue. So what we had in the February plan was what was in the executive budget and then the, uh, the enacted budget at a similar level. As I mentioned, we did receive an, an additional federal grant, ARPA, um, of about 700 million, and that's been now incorporated in the July plan. No change in the biennial 4% uh, fare and toll increase in 23 and 25. So again, all the numbers you're gonna see in terms of projected deficits already assume those fare and toll increases will take place in 23 and 25. We keep congestion pricing as a critical source of funding for the 20 to 24 capital program. Again, you know, the biggest benefit of congestion pricing, as you remember, is to be able to make significant investments in state of good repair without having to issue MTA bonds that would otherwise just further add to our deficit. The forecast period, we extend one year each July. So in February, we went out through 2025, and now we're projecting out through 2026. And as we walk through, through this, our goal has to be how to put MTA in a position of stability through this period and, and beyond. So let's talk about the primary factors in revising the ridership forecasts. So here we have nine factors listed that were modeled to project where we think and where McKinsey projected ridership would go from our current level, which is roughly call it 60, 61 per, percent. And the top three, as you can tell by the size of the font. You're not testing our eyesight yeah, with this. <laughs> <laughs> Neil, Neil only sees six uh, <laughs> factors. <laughs> Things are much better than I thought. So, uh, <laughs> but very good. Um, the, um, so the top three factors, obviously the bigger, future of office work, how many days are people going to be working from home, fewer non-work trips, really the acceleration that the pandemic caused in terms of e-commerce, 
people feel more comfortable with telemedicine, uh, shopping from home, ordering in, so forth and so on. Customer sentiment, which is a big bucket of things, everything from people's view of safety in the system, safety in the city, whether it's related to crime, whether it's related to COVID. And again, that consumer sentiment bucket, because of the ability for people to have the flexibility to work from home or do things through e-commerce, that makes those trips a little bit more, more discretionary. Uh, the uh, other three items, um, well, you, you'll see all of them note, I'm, I'm not going to walk through them, but clearly employment levels and population growth have big, a big factor, as does fare evasion, which you know has gotten worse since 2019 and so forth. So the forecast that we undertook, again, McKinsey did what we call a high case and a low case. So the low case, to start with that, is essentially that all these items, we get a little bit better as the economy grows, a little bit better, but really not, not a whole lot of improvement. There will be improvement in the percentages, but not any big shifts. Where the high case, each one of the factors, just we are a little bit better. People do in-office work a little bit more, you know, retail recovers more, safety, people feel better about the city and the system, um, employment grows a little bit faster versus a little bit slower. Um, but even in the high case, the important thing to remember is the, uh, the top two items are really now viewed more as structural shifts that it's not all of a sudden we're gonna change and everybody's gonna be in the office five days a week for, this, for the sectors that have the flexibility to work from home, which is about 25% um, of, you know, we have, you know, 50% of our trips are work related and half of that are in sectors that have the flexibility to work from home. Those are more permanent structural shifts that really dampen the out year projection. So let's go through, uh, through it. This, this graph shows our previous assumption in the financial plan, where you'll see the, the blue dashed line shows the recovery, and this is for transit and commuter railroads. The bridges and tunnels are about at 100%, so they've fully recovered and they always assume to fully recover. So the, the blue line, the blue dashed line, shows the expected recovery over time, again, versus what 2019 ridership was. And what you'll notice in 2022, for example, 77% this year was our expected average recovery. If you look what happened through 2021, if you look at the solid blue line, that's the actual ridership that we experienced. And if you'll notice, it tracked very well with the forecast until Omicron hit. And so Omicron, you know, if you remember December, January, steep declines in ridership as, as activity, you know, slowed down significantly. We've recovered from Omicron, but if you look at the actuals, you'll see throughout 22, we've somewhat plateaued in and around 61%. The other interesting thing, and we'll about, I'll put up the McKinsey projection, is the duration of time of the pandemic and the lower ridership has really also impacted the structural changes because the more people have been trained to work from home or to order online, it's become more of their, their routine, where if we had a very short pandemic, it would have been less time training people as to how, how, how not to uh, use the system. So based on all of that, here is the new forecast in terms of percentages, where the green shaded area shows the new McKinsey projection, where the lower line is the low case that I talked to, where we recover from 61% 
to 73% over the financial plan period, where the high case, the more optimistic scenario, we go from 61% to out in 26 at 88%. The midpoint, just the average of those, of those two, is out at 80% on the long end and 69% for next year versus our current level of 60, 61%. So what you'll notice is the, you know, again, the blue dashed line was the old midpoint, not the old high case or low case. The high case was, was above the, so, so if you compare that to the new midpoint, I think two things stick out. One, if you just look at the slope of the green line compared to the slope of the dashed blue line, the dashed blue line really assumed herd immunity in late 21, early 22, snap back in, in ridership, okay? Where now the solid green line shows a much slower return to ridership to a much, to a significantly lower, lower level. Okay, so what does this mean financially? So these three lines show fair and toll revenue. So this is a combination of, of all our operating revenue, where the line at the top, the, the dashed black line, shows where we would have expected revenue to grow from 2019 through 2026, just by doing the 4% biennial toll, fare and toll increases but no real change in ridership from 2019. So the black dash line is the pandemic never happened, travel patterns never changed. We just, you know, took action to raise revenue based on kind of the normal, the normal course. The blue line in the middle shows where we, where, what our, where our forecast was in February, where the solid blue in 20 and 21 represents the actual results for those two years. And then the dash blue line is our expectation of where revenue was gonna grow throughout uh, through 26. And the green line is now our new expectation based on the new McKinsey midpoint of where fare and toll revenue would be. Again, with the same 4% biennial increases built in. So a couple things of note, if you look at 2022, in the February plan, we were projecting 7.1 billion of fare and toll revenue. We've now, in this July plan, lowered that revenue projection by approximately a billion dollars to 6.1 billion. And, and the space between the, those lines in 23, in, for, for 2023 is also about a billion dollars. And then it narrows, to where you'll see out in 26, we're lowering our projected revenue by 500 million a year versus the previous projection. But if you look out on the horizon, if the, if the pandemic never occurred, we would have been projecting 9.6 billion of, of revenue in 26, and now we're projecting 7.9, so roughly a, a billion seven, I think with the rounding, it's actually closer to a billion eight of lost revenue uh, out in the, in the horizon. So let's look at the next chart. This shows just the cumulative impact of each one of those lost revenues in each year over the five year period. So if you add all the, the and the, the big change and what's the you know, big change, financial changes between the July financial plan and the February financial plan, the biggest driver is all the way on the left, the fare and toll revenue is projected now to be about $4 billion lower on a cumulative basis from 2022 through 2026. The other negatives, again, remember, if it's a cost, higher costs are negative. If it's revenue, less revenue is negative. So 
the uh, we have higher expenses, mainly fuel and power, that um, versus in the July plan versus February, slightly higher debt service due to higher interest rates, some other adjustments. We did we do have a substantial surplus when we close the books on 21 that we can now incorporate, uh, related mainly to a you know much lower expense run. A lot of that Omicron things kind of shut down. And we had, uh, you know, as we always do, we carry over um, general reserve fund balances, which are like the contingencies that we can then, then release. And then federal aid and dedicated taxes are up. We had additional, as I mentioned, the, the federal COVID relief. Some of our real estate taxes have been a little bit higher. Most of that's the, the, the federal relief for a net impact over the period of about 2.7 billion. So a couple of the big positives are offsetting what otherwise would be, you know, even bigger negatives. But let's let's take a look on what that means on an annual basis. Sure. Uh, on the left column, um, lower projected fare and toll. Since you, a few minutes ago, said the the uh, bridges and tunnels tolls has returned to virtually a hundred percent basically that's lost fares on the yeah actually the f the toll revenue is a l little bit higher the fare revenue is actually a little bit bigger than the 3.9 billion yes thank you i, I want to keep the questions until he's done and okay, i can so flip back just... to slides if yeah. people have questions at the end no no, no problem so what what this chart shows is where the underlying deficits were in the February plan. Now it's important to note this is before we we apply feder we use federal aid to offset these deficits. So if you look um, at these where we were in February, we had two years of actual deficits in 2020 and 21 of about three and a half billion. They were offset with f federal COVID aid, and then we had projected deficits. 22 through 26 in February. Again, we were going to have enough, we calculated enough federal aid to cover those deficits through 2025. But importantly, now here's what the chart looks like when you add in the additional, the growth in the deficits due to the lower, lower ridership. So, and where, where you'll see for 22 through 26, the deficits, again, before we can use federal, you know, before we apply federal aid, roughly two and a half to 2.6 billion a year of underlying deficits based on the new, new McKinsey midpoint. Now, the other important calculation mentioned is, well, how long is the federal aid gonna, gonna last? And so what this graph shows is that we're calculating that the federal aid is sufficient to cover the deficits through 24, 2024, not 2025. Again, it's actually more federal aid, remember, but when you have bigger deficits, you spend the federal aid quicker, which means you run out quicker. So we're basically out of federal aid by 2024, which is a year earlier. There is a little bit of a balance left over of 300 million that we could apply to 25 and 26. But the bottom line is our fiscal cliff is now in excess of two and a half billion and is a year earlier than where just we were in February. So I want to talk a little bit about, you know, these are all forecasts based on a lot of assumptions. I want to you know, lay out the assumptions and talk a little about the risks just to, again, just to put in context because the deficits could, could grow larger and, and obviously important. And not only can they go larger when you think we just barely have enough money to cover us through 2024, any of these risks playing out would then all of a sudden make our problem move into 24 rather than be 25. So the revenue forecast is certainly a risk. You know, we have, we've had to 
bring down the forecast significantly between the previous forecast and what we're what we're using now. You know, if we have if we end up tracking the low case, which just is that more modest return of ridership, you know, costs us 350 million a year um, in in additional lost lost revenue. Um, dedicated taxes, um, you know, is you know clearly a risk to the plan. Um, you know, the you know due to you know any a slower economy or recession, as everybody knows, the Fed, in terms of fighting inflation, is pushing hard to slow the economy. And you know, just to put it in context, if you think about all our economically sensitive taxes, you know, between the real estate taxes, the corporate profits taxes, payroll taxes, sales taxes, you know, it's easy, you know, 500 million to a, a billion um, could easily be the, the movement in those taxes. Um, inflation is, is a risk in the budget. We've got built in the higher, higher energy costs. But, you know, if you look at the economists are really forecasting that the Fed's going to win the fight and push inflation back down into the you know two to two and a half percent level. If they don't, that certainly will cost us in terms of uh, bleeding into additional expenses. And then the, the last two assumptions we have are you know labor settlements and the fare and toll increase, where we've used again our standard assumptions of of two percent on. Uh, labor negotiations um, after you know, the you know, TWU, as everyone knows, comes up next May. And tied to that, we've assumed the same you know, 4% biennial or 2% per year uh, toll increases. And we've kind of laid out, you know, quantified what the, the cost is for every 1% on labor. It's about $100 million. And then clearly, you know, any deferral of the fare and toll increase out in 2025, that's 500 million a year. Just to keep, you know, if that got deferred, that's the additional add to the deficit that that would occur. You know, clearly our biggest risk is, you know, and we're going to talk in a second, getting the additional revenues we need to deal with the fiscal cliff. These are risks, in addition, that would grow the deficits, not risks to solving the. the the, the issue we have with the deficit. So one, you know, I want to put out one thing to think about is where we can go from here. You know, as I meant, as Neil mentioned, I came in in February as CFO and I really want to take a fresh look at the financial challenges facing the MTA. What is the responsible way to attack the problem? As you see in this chart, I've, I've extended the analysis to 2028 to look for more than just a short-term solution, but think you know, beyond the edge of the page. The punchline is, if we work together and start solving the deficit in 2023, we can lower the fiscal cliff by a billion dollars a year. On the left, the, the current assumptions is sped, spend all the federal aid early, delay taking any action, bond out the deficit financing. The result is a fiscal cliff that we talked about of 2.5 to 2.7 billion per year. This is not the responsible way to go. This is, in essence, just kicking the can. Particularly in light of now we have a new forecast that shows how entrenched the assumptions are on our ridership recovery. So what are we waiting for? The, the new normal is here. On the right, take the responsible course. Use the federal aid to not just buy time, but to lower the cost structure over the medium term. Tackle, tackle our debt service costs with some of the money. Spread out the benefit. 
Do not do the deficit financing. Again, de the deficit financing doesn't solve the deficit. It just delays when you, how long until you deal with the deficit. Attack the problem sooner rather than later, which means solutions starting in 2023. As you'll note here on the right, what that means is finding additional revenue of almost 800 million in 2023, and then 1.6 billion a year from 24 on out. The benefit of these actions collectively, which can only be done by acting early is to lower the fiscal cliff by a billion dollars. So given what we know now, in my opinion, this is the only responsible approach to best fund and deliver transit to the region. So the key takeaways, the fiscal cliff has moved up, it's earlier from 26 to 25. Deficits, if we don't do anything, projected to be two and a half billion a year. We will work on our side on operating efficiencies, which we've done you know, for many years to keep putting them in place to lower costs. A lot of that may be consumed just in managing the risks that we have that we laid out with inflation, so forth and so on. But again, the fiscal cliff can be reduced by up to a billion a year by using the federal COVID relief funds in a smarter, more sustainable way, avoiding a costly deficit financing to just delay the problem. But all that is gonna take action in early 2023. And the new dedicated funding is necessary to avoid what we all wanna avoid which only cuts against what we're trying to do, large fare increases, service cuts, and layoffs. Uh, I just for myself, I'm sure I'm speaking for others, say that was very crisp, very thoughtful, and stark. So uh, here's what we'll do. Uh, we have, let's just do 20 minutes. So we've got a bit of an agenda. I'm gonna suggest, not require, but suggest that people ask questions about clarification as opposed to opinion at this point. We can use Wednesday for opinion, I think, given it may take a little time to digest a bit of this. But uh, obviously you can say what you want or ask what you want, but let's focus on questions of clarification, if you wouldn't mind. David, please. Have you uh, calculated, because uh, elected officials seem to be very adverse to doing anything about congestion <laughs> pricing, whether the dates you've indicated uh, might shift out further? Well, I guess important points about congestion pricing. Again, remember, congestion pricing is dedicated to the capital Understood. program. So it's, it doesn't directly flow into the operating The debt budget. service, however, will increase. Right. So the, exactly. So to answer your question, we, we haven't calculated it, but a, a key important element to the 20 to 24 capital program is that any MTA bonds and the MTA bonds which we've re reduced in the amendment are issued or the last funding source of the capital program, you know, out in 27, 28, 29. So to keep that as a practical assumption and to keep the commitments to, you know, all the state of good repair that's going on, which is critical you know, no, no way, one mm -hmm. way to lose ridership is to not have reliability. But what's critical to that is to be able to have all the funding before we have to issue the MTA bonds. We have to issue them earlier. You know, 10 billion of MTA bonds is 500 million a year of interest. You can see what that, that would add to. Fortunately, the state and the city have stepped up with their $3 billion commitments and we're well on the way. The federal money, we've gotten more through the, the um, Bipartisan Infrastructure Act. We're getting revenues, both state and city sales tax and the um, mansion tax flowing into the capital lockbox. But if we don't get congestion pricing, we're going to have two bad decisions. Do we continue to commit to do what we need to do on capital and 
make the problem worse on the operating budget, or are we, do we defer important projects that we've decided to take on? Um, so when McKinsey, thank you, Kevin, by the way, it was very crisp and very detailed. When McKinsey redid their um, calculations in February, they just uh, calculated, I guess, this Omicron variant, right? They didn't calculate another, God forbid, another variant coming into the... Right. So the... I'm flipping back. Yes. So the <clears throat> McKinsey projection now is not, yes, it's not based on more views of another variants coming in and shutting things down right. and so forth. It, you know, clearly when you look at the, you know, I'll, I'll call it the consumer sentiment bucket, right, which is the, you know, 15 percent of riders saying for one reason or another, they're, they're not taking that, it. Right. A lot of it may be driven because they can work from home or whatever. You know, the, you know, my view is the more subvariants we have and the less effective, that just slows how much we just, you know, get recovery from that. But yes, to but answer did, your did McKinsey, and I'm sorry that if I'm not getting this, did McKinsey say that by 2026 people would be back in the office, or do they assume that you're still going to so, have? Yeah. People? So, yeah. So, good question. So the high case scenario, the optimistic McKinsey scenario in 26 says that on average people will still choose to work from home two days per week for the sectors that can work okay. from home. Okay. And their low case assumption is that people will work from home three days a week rather than two. Now the difference between the low and the high is not all work from home. It's a lot, you know, it's all those factors getting better to get from the low case to the high case you not only need to have people just work from home two days a week, you need to have people feel safer about the city and the system. You need to have a recovery of retail of a certain amount, you know, again, which is all tied together. You need a growth in the economy, both in terms of recovery of, of, of jobs in the region. You, you need, you know, be, you know, population growth, you know, inflows overpowering you know, out migration. So it's all those factors in here. Can I offer one clarification? I would say that based on your briefings and McKinsey, that they would say that the, the range on all these variables between low and high is not extreme. That they, they, they portray both the low and the high as um, realistic cases. Options, right. So you're not talking about huge swings in mm -hmm. there, again, in their portrayal, not huge swings. Just as we're talking about two days versus three days in work from home, they're similar, they, they portray it as the range of, a, a moderate range in every variable. So they, they were at pains yes. to emphasize that these are both realistic scenarios, both the low and the high. They're not, quote unquote, optimistic or pessimistic. Mm -hmm. They're both realistic scenarios, although a little different. Yeah, okay. no, I think that's a good, that's a good point. Um, you know, Again, a little bit hard to model, but I don't think they've assigned a higher probability to one outcome versus, you know, versus another. Just, you know, as you said, kind of two potential outcomes based on different trends and all, all the factors. But they forecasted the new norm. Which right. is the right. And then um, what a, one last question, and, and Neil, tell me if I should. So you say taking action early. What does that mean? Well, to take action early means we need new revenue starting in 23, okay? So, you know, like, you know, like anything, you know, like any problem, the earlier you address it, the, the lower the problem. If you look at this, you know, our financial structure, the, you know, by being able to take that federal relief money and apply it in a smarter way to reduce things like our debt service over that kind of somewhat extended period, Okay. The only way you can do that is if you're not spending it as fast as possible, and the only way you can spend it, not spend it as fast as possible, is if you have other resources to supplement, you know, the uh, the lost ridership. Okay, Robert. Anyone? I just want to say, who other hands? Anyone else want to ask? All right. So we'll just Robert then Norman. Hi, Chair. It's Midori. I'd love to ask a question and be in the lineup. 
Okay, Midori. Thank, thank you, Midori. All right, Robert, then yeah. Norman, then Midori. Go ahead. Just on the ridership estimate, I mean, you mentioned the uh, Omicron variant. Right. I'm not convinced any of this has anything to do with any variants anymore because people are continuing with their lives in every other aspect, including plane travel and everywhere else. Correct. So I don't think it's a COVID issue, right? So if we're looking at a reduction in ridership of 40%, which is where we are right now, right? We have less riders than 40%. So the issue that we have to deal with, in addition to the revenue problem, is the underlying revenue problem is the result of us having 40% less customers. Correct. So we want to operate a system the way we currently operating a system, even though we are serving 40% less people in, in theory, right? So you present it as there's a revenue aspect to this. And on the revenue aspect, part of that is people who pay fares and people who don't. Prior to COVID, we discussed fare evasion because it was a growing problem before COVID. Anecdotally, I've heard that it's gone worse, not better. And we talked about coming up with new estimates. So what are the estimates? Because that's the big revenue stream. You showed a billion dollars loss in fair box revenue. I don't know what the estimates are presently for how much we're losing through fair evasion or what we're doing about it. If we're losing that much for fair evasion and we're talking about revenues, we need to first capture the people that we've made a decision that fares cost X, it costs X to ride. But if we're not enforcing that fares, then we're just supplanting that and finding other revenues really to support fare evaders. So there are multiple facets to this mm -hmm. challenge. One is also how are we getting riders back? Right, this suggests that we're just, this is what it is. And if this is what it is, then we're not getting riders back. We're just saying we're going to operate an MTA with 80% of what it was, 70% of what it was, 60% of what it was, or whatever that is. We need a plan to say how are we going to bring riders back or not. And we're saying then we'll just, so that we're talking here about the revenue part of it. But part of this is as a business, right? We're serving customers, we want customers, or we're going to say it's a new MTA. We have a massive capital plan that's supported through congestion pricing, which was designed around, as I recall, vast projections of increased ridership in the MTA, uh, capacity increases that we needed to support overcrowding. Right? This presentation caused us to, re to look at all of these things and understand like where are we actually going. So we have a short-term issue here, and you're presented as moves the deficit from 2005, from 2025 to 2024. But there are many more issues that we kind mm -hmm. of have to address besides just, you know, are we getting new revenues into the system? You know, is it a different system? How are we going to deal with fare evasion? Maybe there's times to make new investments and new technologies in order to avoid that happening. We hadn't wanted to do that before. Maybe it's time. So I think this opens the door for a much broader discussion on how are we going to deal with bringing our customer base back and if we're not right then we're just dealing with a different system and a lot of the assumptions that a lot of the decisions that we made over you know the past few years right have to be revisited all of them I think, uh, yeah please. Uh, robert's raised a lot of good questions but i so before we go on if i can make just quick mm -hmm. responses to a couple of them one um how are we getting riders back? One, we had a system of discounts that we're going to continue to grow, um, which is meant to attract riders back. But the, the, the key is dealing with what riders are concerned about, at least what they tell us. It starts with dealing with what riders tell us they're concerned about, which is safety. And dealing with that is what more than 50 percent of our riders say is the principal issue. They have both lapsed riders, more, even more so than current riders is issues of safety and concern. It comes in different, it's articulated in different ways about, mostly about people behaving radically. The, the mental health population has found its way into the public space. So that's what our riders are telling us they are concerned about on the subway, which right now has the most dramatic reductions in ridership. Interestingly, the commuter railroads have actually surpassed the subway in terms of their, their ridership relative to pre-COVID. So service, reliability, safety. 
to your point about the capital program, the capital program it did have elements that went to capacity, but as we just heard in the prior C uh, CPC meeting, the capital program meeting, the, the, the element of the capital program that went principally to capacity, which is CBTC, the resignaling program, has been adjusted to focus even more on the oldest elements of the system to give more reliability, especially to historically disadvantaged communities, people who ride the A, uh, the D, the B, and the F from communities, historic, as I say, historically disadvantaged communities tend to be black and brown communities. So we have shifted our capital program, a big piece of our capital program, to make sure, honestly, Robert, that we are not just focusing on growing capacity, but we are really dealing with chronic problems of reliability that especially go to uh, uh, areas that have historically had some less than ideal service. But there are elements you know, but our capital program, to a great extent, you hear it again and again, is focused on zero emissions buses. That's not a capacity issue. It's focused on ADA accessibility, which I think in the long run is going to be a huge strong point for us when we're trying to attract riders because people with mobility issues and parents with strollers and our older neighbors are going to be more inclined to ride. But ADA is not per se a capacity. So the capital program, I would say, and then of course the 80% of the capital program that is state of good repair, right? So to your point, which is a good one, about whether our capital program is disproportionately focused on capacity, I would say at this point that is probably not the case. It is very much state of good repair plus some of these other key investments. But um, to your, finally, to your point about fare evasion, I've been very upfront about this. Fare evasion has grown. All of our indications are they're not the science of evaluating fare evasion ain't perfect, but we have seen our 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 supporters in you know the the NYPD, which polices the subways uh, for us, um, has done more fare evasion enforcement. They are trying not they are not doing more arrests. They are doing more enforcement where they deter people and they are, you know, they're giving out tab summonses. But we, the other initiative, and I'm looking at David Jones because he's a leader in it, is we're trying to figure out a system where we can do m more fair evasion deterrence, but without getting into the problems of criminalizing young people or people who make a first time mistake. So that is the, the panel that I appointed, which is directly going at trying to come up with a fair evasion enforcement model, which will reduce the scale of fare evasion, but do it in a way that doesn't have these negative social consequences that Board Member Jones yeah. has been talking about. So those are the three issues you raised. All right, no, no, uh, well, let's, okay, let's I'm do sorry. What, oh, okay. Yeah, but we got to be, I'm trying to get one at a time, one, only one per, we only have a limited amount of time. Robert, go ahead. Please. Yeah, I just want to, I'm not suggesting that we revisit like the capital plan, but we should revisit any assumptions that we made with regard to capacity or that were based on long-term trends on ridership, which seems, if we're basing things on the McKinsey analysis, have changed. Right? So we just go back and look, are there things, assumptions that we made based on ridership and growth? Right? We should be re-looking at those. On the issue of bringing our customers back, right, the consumer sentiment survey that was recent, that was discussed today, right, to your point, right, if those are the reasons that people aren't coming back, right, they're not COVID-related anymore, they're based on these things, and we need to come up with a plan to address those things. I know we have started, right, but hadn't, people haven't responded to them. And then things like the free credits that we did or the discounts, I'd like to see if, you know, have those, like any business, right? You do a discount, you give the coupons, have they resulted in what you want or did we just give discounts and mm -hmm. we're getting the same ridership or even less? So are they working? That's something that we need to do. So on all of these things, we just need to see, are we doing the right things? Are we making changes? And are they resulting in the impacts that we want with regards to our customer base? Okay. Nor Norman and then Midori. I think the point is very clear. On what Robert's saying, new new world, new cost structure. Great. I think he's what he's saying. Norman. Well, I think he was also saying new revenue structure for the. You don't know where the money's coming from. You don't know where you're going to fall in this chart, from the top or the bottom. All on that side. What I'd like to know is how do we, how does the how do the projections fit in, on the other array of MTA revenues that come into our reservoir of financing. How's the 
projections for mortgage recording taxes. Seems to me the mortgage recording tax has probably done pretty well in this period. Uh, uh, urban tax, all those payroll mobility tax, um, Uber tax, the whole, we have a whole alphabet of uh, other sources. And we seem to not be discussing that because in, in the end of the day, um, while I agree with almost everything Robert said here, it, it is sort of a dilemma we have when it comes to what are you going to do about the fare box not providing that much support? And if the result is cut service, then you're going to end up driving more people out of the system. Because when you go down there, when you go down on the subway in the middle of the night and it says 18 minutes here, you start to look at everybody else on the platform and wonder if you're going to make it back to Brooklyn. Um, and so these other so these other, so it is a new world here. It's a new world as far as demand goes for our product, uh, but it's also a new world for these revenue streams. Are we going to get more from the payroll mobility tax? I mean, obviously, I don't have any answers to these, but I feel that that should have the same sort of projections. Of this is what we could get on the top. This is what we could get on the bottom. Midori, go ahead, and then John. Hi, thanks everyone. Sorry, I'm just on video today. But so we've been talking a little bit about this McKinsey report. And I know that this Kevin reflects a refinement of that report. I think the board will really benefit from more details regarding the new refinement of the forecast, especially as you know, we talk about kind of a new normal, there's definitely going to be a difference in what's happening with commuter railroads, buses and transit systems. So we should get a sense of that those kind of trends. If we're baking so much of our forecast based on ridership, which is based on a refinement of a McKinsey report, I think we just need the details. And that would just also help us inform our future thinking as well. It's, I, I feel like it's a little bit difficult for the board to weigh in with some of those details. So, so that's my request. Um, and, you know, I hear people already talking about service and Robert, I appreciate what you said about, you know, really looking at this because as a business, if we're catering to less ridership, what does it mean? But we also know and I think the chair has pointed out in prior occasions that the system right now is just so heavily relied on by those who need it most so you know that that's really important too that what does it mean if ridership decreases but the remaining ridership are the people you know who are so critical to running New York City in the New York region. So I think we just have to keep that in mind. Um, and then just thinking about what are the ways that even from things related to security and policing, what are the ways that we are going to measure return on investment? Because it sounds like we're going into a phase, not like it wasn't before, but we're going into a phase where every dollar really counts. And so we really have to understand what the metrics are and how we're going to define success for that investment investment of the dollar. And so if that looks like reduced um, crime statistics, if that I'm not sure what that looks like, but you know, just a further refinement on the security and safety endeavors um, that the MTA is taking. I'm not talking about NYPD, I'm talking about MTA. What are those um, return on investment metrics that we're looking at? So those are, I think, are like the three things I want to um, highlight and the McKinsey report, any refinement of details on that would be super helpful. Yeah, uh, we, we will be uh, publishing the McKinsey reports, obviously be available to everybody, including the public on uh, Wednesday. Um, and, and of course, happy to, uh, okay. you know, as board members read it and um, absorb it to answer you know any questions that uh, that any anybody has you know again it's you know it's a lot of factors you know we can't apply false precision to each one of the factors um, because there's a lot of you know um, interrelationships people you know responding to surveys you know is, is kind of our best data and and you know to Robert's point is there's things that in those factors there's things we have you know we can put effort towards whether it's fair evasion whether it's the consumer sentiment feeling safety and so forth and the you know as i mentioned to get from the low case to the high case or even anywhere in between 
requires improvements on, on all the factors. So it, it can't be that we sit back and just let's hope that people come back to work one extra day a, a week. We actually, that'll, that'll be extremely disappointing in its results in terms of revenue if we don't make progress on fare evasion, we don't make progress on people feeling safe in the system and attacking all the, all the issues that are keeping people away. Um, it's, it, it's not, you know, it's, it's got to be an active effort. Okay, John, you're next. Yeah, so just a an observation, a couple observations and a question. The um, congestion pricing was referenced and you spoke about that as being capital money, but the one thing that it does do is, is gives the MTA the ability not to take money from the fare box and pump it into capital. So I don't know what the budget line right now is that you have on pay-go capital, but I've had this debate at this board several times before about pay-go capital. It's operating money, and you, pump, and you put it into capital projects. So congestion pricing comes. We're flush with capital money. There's no more reason to have a pay-go. Sorry about that. There's no more reason to have a pay-go capital budget line. And it's been in the hundreds of millions of dollars, especially when we go into a contract negotiation. All of a sudden, all kinds of money is going out of the fare box into the capital plan. And that's the truth. And um, the second piece of that, congestion pricing's coming. We, we're we're going to find ourselves in a situation where the system nearly collapsed in 2016 because we were flush with capital money and had no operating money. And it would probably be a fairly simple act by New York State government to allow us to flex congestion pricing money into the operating budget, at least to get us through this crisis. Um, and I, I think that's a logical step to take. Um, it, may, and it, it may not be a step that you all want to take because you may be thinking that you're going to have to settle contracts that you don't want to settle because you'll have operating money all of a sudden. But it's a logical step. And the money is way more important to be on the operating budget side right now than it is on the capital side, um, or it will be then. And just the, the last thing is a question. Um, you spoke about the federal stimulus money. How much of what you're talking about is American Rescue Plan money, do you know? Sure. The, um, the American Rescue Plan money is approximately $7 billion of the 15 one in net. In right. Okay. Services. So there's, as you would know, there's extreme limitations on what you can use the American Rescue Plan money for. And, um, you know, it, it doesn't, the information that you put up there doesn't delineate how much American Rescue Plan money is being used for what. Um, and I'd, I'd like to see that. You know, I don't, I don't sure. know. Yeah. The, the the American Rescue Plan money is all driven to close the deficits in the operating budget, irrespective of which line item we apply in the operating budget. So none of it's going to capital in either scenario I, right, okay. I laid out. So All right, but there is I, still I American Rescue Plan money left then. Yeah, yes, under the fast spend approach, we would be out of it at the end of 24. Mm -hmm. And out of the, what I call the responsible, bring down the lo longer cost structure, we you know, sp spread it out a, a, a few more years. But none of it's going to capital. It's all going to close, you know, basically to help close the deficit created by the loss of ridership, whether it's the loss of ridership this year, next year, or over the next several years. And do you, do you know how much... Do you know how much pay-go capital is projected in those out years, in, in from now into the out years that, are, that were put up on the screen? Uh, I'll have to get back to you on the exact amount, but it, we, we have reduced the pay-go capital. Um, and just to point to that, the pay-go capital also, at the end of the day, reduces how many bonds we issue, So, it, which when we issue bonds, that comes out of the operating budget. So I, I understand your point. Yeah, it is. There's a there's, timing issue, so okay. I respect your point. And just, it. just one last thing. We have, I just looked it up on my, on my phone, my trusty phone, because I wasn't sure. I looked at all the various committees. Perhaps it's time for the MTA to have a political and legislative committee to begin to affect positive legislation that will drive us forward. Um, it's stuff that we've been doing in Washington without, you know, without kind of any structure. I was doing it with Pat and to some extent, I'm doing it with Jano as well. And I'm sure you're aware, and Jano is certainly aware, that so much of the uh, federal stimulus money that you're talking about is, was trade union driven. Um, it wouldn't, in fact, that money wouldn't even be on a screen if it wasn't for the trade unions. 
uh, advocating for it in Washington, D.C., and we continue to do it. Can I defer and that I, topic to the Governance Committee, please? That's okay? All right. I'm just making a point. This is a, and, and, and it's a good one. Uh, other comments or questions? I think one more. Anyone else? Going once? Going twice? Okay, so since we're short on time, Pat, would you mind? Do we need to cover this? Do you feel like we have to cover this? Uh, Finance Watch, uh, I, no, I, I, I think the, I think the, the board received Marcia's email. There's Correct. a lot of good detail in there about our inaugural issuance of uh, city sales tax bonds. So that, that was You do really a wonderful the, job, but maybe this month, given the time pressing okay. nature, I'm going to skip over you. And then Mark, the same on the information items. They're I think standard. Just, I think, yeah, they're pretty standard. So let's just go right to Frederica. Frederica, we might come up and we're going to do real estate first and cover the transit wireless piece that uh, was mentioned last week. Floor is yours. Okay. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. I'm here to request your approval to expand our partnership with Transit Wireless. Um, it's a great opportunity to, to make our customers trip better, uh, to bring private investment into the system, and to generate revenue. The cell service um, that we enjoy in the subway stations today comes to us via the TW installed and operated network. It was no small feat to figure out how to get all of that equipment and make it work in our old system, but they figured it out, and it works well for our customers, and it generates revenues for the MTA. Uh, over the course of the multi-year build, the MTA also turned to Transit Wireless to meet our evolving technology needs. We leverage both the construction and the infrastructure itself at a competitive price uh, to support things like help points and uh, beacon countdown clocks, and we do make annual payments to Transit Wireless for these services. As ambitious as that project was when the partnership started, it needs to be improved. Um, people today, they want to be able to send emails or texts or look at their news feed or do whatever uh, through their entire trip and not have their connection phase in and out as they're going through the tunnels from one station to another. And Transit Wireless is uniquely positioned to support an expansion given its infrastructure. Uh, and I'm pleased to say, whoops, sorry, um, that the current Transit Wireless leadership has stepped up to a deal that provides more for our customers and is good for the MTA. For our customers, we'll have cell service in all the tunnels. Obviously, this is a tremendous benefit. And Transit Wireless will extend the Wi-Fi so that all of our stations including Staten Island, will have Wi-Fi. And using the above-ground infrastructure, there are opportunities to enhance cell service coverage in above-ground stations um, as the carriers need to uh, extend their cell services to those areas. Uh, for MTA operations, we'll get better access to fiber optic cable and Wi-Fi, which are uh, foundational equipment and service for so many technology projects. Finally, our existing payments uh, for services that I mentioned before will be phased out, and there will also be new revenue streams. So creating all this new service will require uh, about uh, over $600 million in private capital investment. It's a massive undertaking. Uh, to get cell service to every subway track between every station, a couple hundred miles of tunnel will be fitted out with fiber and cable antenna. It's going to take time. To get this done, we will have to carefully coordinate this tunnel work with the rest of our essential and ambitious state of good repair capital program. Uh, fortunately, Transit Wireless is able to leverage its existing infrastructure to make this expansion easier, faster, and less expensive. They have a sprawling infrastructure with fiber that goes into every station, subway station, and ties back into um, data centers that are spread out throughout the city. It's, this equipment would be essential for the tunnel service, and so it doesn't make sense to duplicate it. Our commercial terms incorporate what we've learned from our other private sector partnerships. First, the MTA gets operational benefits like access to fiber. These are baked into the economics of the deal. Second, MTA and Transit Wireless uh, incentives are aligned throughout the project, so revenue growth, and revenue share occur as the project is, is completed. And so we're both aligned to get it done as fast as possible and at the lowest cost. Because of the size of the investment, the term is long, up to 10-year build period with 20 years of operations. 
It makes sense to also extend our existing station uh, agreement and the standalone Canarsie agreement to, to be coterminous with that. So the entire project, which really operates as an integrated infrastructure, is expires at the same time. We're also asking for two five-year options at the end that will, um, you know, be available to us if the project still makes beneficial uh, economic sense for the MTA. We can recommend these terms because we've analyzed these from multiple different angles. We've tested the market with two previous RFPs. We've compared it against industry returns and other transit agency projects. So in total, this project adds up to well over a billion dollars in benefits to the MTA and its customers over the life of the contract. So private capital investment of over 600 million benefiting riders and MTA operations at no cost to the MTA. Our operating expenses are reduced through those uh, declining payments that we make to uh, Transit Wireless. We also get a minimum annual compensation guarantee that increases as the build is, is completed. And we estimate that at about 200 million. And with the extension of the existing agreements at the back end, we get uh, additional guaranteed revenue that's beyond 2038. And finally, um, which is hard to quantify, the support for operations through access to fiber and Wi-Fi. So in sum, this is the ac action that we're asking you to approve. Approval of the commercial terms that are in the staff summary, the extension of station and Canarsie agreement to be coterminous. And you know, in, we think this is a great project for our customers and for the MTA. I'm here to take any questions or comments that you may have. Questions? I have a question. Please. Um, Frederica, first of all, congratulations. I know you worked really hard on this, and um, you've done great work. The revenue sharing number, is that the $200 million, or is it additional? So the, the $200 million is sort of our minimum, our sort of estimates of the minimum. So that, that minimum sort of increases as each tunnel segment is built out. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of, but once it's fully built, it's a kind of a run rate of about $5 million a year, escalated, inflated, you know. Um, so over the life of the 30 years, that's about $200 million. There's, if there's revenue share, that comes in on top. Okay. And we do, you know, it, the revenue share increases over time from 20% to 40%. And we also have some windfall protection. If the project is widely successful, we'll Got get it. more money. Okay. All right. Thank you. Any other questions? Can I get a motion? Second. Second. Any comments, questions? It's a great project, Rodrigo. Thank you. Looking forward to seeing that. And thankfully, we're not paying a dollar of capital. That's great. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions. Motion carries. All right, uh, David, on to you for the rest of the real estate items, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Real estate has five additional uh, action items for consideration. There are three for the MTA. The first is the adoption of a, adoption of a policy to license property in support of first mile, last mile activities at passenger stations. The second is a policy governing the MTA entering into licensed transactions for non-revenue non -revenue generating use as an MTA agency property. The third is the license with Northwell Healthcare for the installation of MTA PD radio antennas in Manhattan and Staten Island. The last three are all with New York City Transit and they include a short-term license agreement with a prospective tenant for parking at 885th and 38th. And the fifth is a short-term access agreement for MTA C and D subgrade vault work at 300 West 14th, the last being the transit wireless piece. There are addition, additional three information items. I know there is a typo on the uh, Poughkeepsie information item. The permittee should read Bike New York, not to DIA Foundation, and that correction will be made for the agenda. Happy to answer any questions regarding the foregoing. Are there any questions? Uh, having, I think we had a presentation first mile, last mile, and uh, the Joint Railroad Committee, and that's another good local program that I hope a lot of municipalities take advantage of. Motion? So moved. So moved. Second? Second. Comments, questions? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions. Motion carry. Okay. Kavash, you and your mellifluous voice. Let's, <laughs> let's get through this thing. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. There are 10 items for MTA headquarters for Finance Committee approval this month, totaling $127.3 million. Uh, these items are found in the Finance Committee book on pages 32 to 52. Uh, the first item will be presented by Lizette Camilo, 
the MTA's Chief Administrative Officer, um, Lizette. Thank you, Kavesh. And I'm sorry I'm not going to be as, you know, sounding as, as lovely as, as Kavesh is. But the first item uh, for procurement is a, a modification for additional funding uh, to the all agency timekeeping system contract with Kronos Inc. to provide one year of software licensing and support, continued maintenance of hardware, firmware upgrades, and professional services. The funding necessary for these critical timekeeping services totals $8,770,992. Uh, this will cover services through and including August 30th, 2023. So since the ransomware attack on Kronos in December, the MTA has been working diligently on multiple tracks to one, secure our, that our systems uh, are, are hardened against further impact of this um, attack, and two, to ensure that all of our employees get paid a full any amounts owed during the outage as quickly as possible. While any delay in payment is something that we take very seriously, uh, so far no one has missed a single paycheck, and the overwhelming majority of the employees were minimally affected, if at all. And specifically, so far we found that between 90 and 95 percent of employees were paid within $150 of what they should have gotten paid. Our timekeeping employees are working as quickly as possible to correct any under and over payments, but we engaged a consultant, Guidehouse, to help us find any efficiencies in our process. Guidehouse determined that we're doing everything that we can do to work as expeditiously as possible. This work is manual in nature, and the complexity of our work rules make this a complicated effort, but we've done, we're, we've done everything we can do to expedite it. Now, related to the procurement action before you, we also engaged Guidehouse to assess the marketplace to determine if there are alternative timekeeping systems that would meet our needs for us to change vendors. And they found that though there are other systems available, they didn't provide functionality that was vastly superior to Kronos. And given the complexity of our payroll and work rules, we would have to invest in programming a new software platform which would take significant amount of time and money to do so. So the bottom line, is that they did not recommend that we change the Kronos software platform due to those reasons. However, Guidehouse did find that the implementation work that UKG, the company that owns Kronos, did for the MTA did not meet our expectations. They also confirmed that there are other vendors in the market with the ability to perform these services, which we will explore. The majority of the funds uh, we seek for approval today are for licensing fees, of, for 5.7 million, clock support, hardware, new hardware, and professional services. I will note that we are requesting spending authority for approximately $8.8 .8 million in this contract modification, but the legal team is working on obtaining additional financial concessions from UKG. And I'll turn it back to Kavesh. Chair, any questions or comments on that? I submit that item for approval. Okay. Anyway, any questions on Kronos? All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries. Keep going, Kavesh. Thank you. Chair, the next item is the award of a six-year contract to Giro Incorporated to upgrade the existing haste scheduling system to the latest 22, 2022 version for subways and bus operations in the amount of $7,922,713. This system provides route definition, network mapping, vehicle movements, timetables, uh, time crew assignments, rostering, and crew optimization, all being critical for on-time performance for New York City Transit. The next item is a modification to extend an all-agency contract with Sprague operating resources in the amount of $61.5 million, $61 million for a period of four months to continue to supply and deliver bulk gasoline, diesel, heating fuels, and related services for MTA's operating agencies while a consolidated RFP for all agencies and all fuels is completed. The next is a modification to the WSP USA Inc. contract for transportation planning and research services, adding an amount not to exceed $8.725 million to cover services to complete the environmental submittal to, for the Central Business District Tolling Program Environmental Review. I submit these items for your approval. Okay, any questions for those three? Have a motion, please? 
Second. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Thank you. Motion passes. Keep going, Kavesh. Thank you, sir. Uh, next is a modification to add funding in the not to exceed amount of $2,707,707 to the miscellaneous services contract with KD Analytical for the design, delivery, installation, and initial maintenance service agreements for the expansion of the MTA's protect chemical detection system. In, in, in the Grand Central Madison at Grand Central Terminal and Monyahan train hall adjacent to Penn Station. The next item is a modification to extend the current contract with Quality and Assurance Technology Corporation to continue to furnish and deliver Dell PCs, laptops, and related accessories to the MTA on an as-needed basis for a three-year period in the amount of $20,230,000. And next is an award of a personal services contract in the amount of $1.56 million to Oliver Wyman Actuarial Consulting Services for actuarial and risk management consulting services in connection with the self-insured program for the MTA agencies insured through the First Mutual Transportation Assurance Company. Uh, Chair, there was a question uh, on the... Um, Q&A technology cop on the pricing. Are you comfortable with that? Well, can you give us a little bit more? We spent a little time last time talking about the, the MTA's pricing, which seemed, did not seem extraordinarily favorable given our buying power. So maybe you can yes. just give us a little bit more on that one. Okay. Can you put that presentation up, please? So, Chair, as... Um, and, and commissioners, as you can see, what we have is uh, uh, for desktops, we have a specific requirement that the MTA has um, in, in procuring desktops. Uh, firstly, the Dell lists a catalog price of 2,600. Um, the Dell.com pricing on a similar Apples for Apples desktop is if you had to go onto the internet you would pay $1,674, and the MTA gets a pricing of $1,075. That also excludes services that we have negotiated that would be free, uh, by, that are provided by the service provider uh, with regard to asset tagging, asset reporting, and also connected configuration imaging. Um, and also in the unlikely event, should we go through another, um, uh, you know, remote work from home, we have the ability where this company would then also deliver to our employees who need it. So we have, we have the desktop. We then have a, a, another desktop that we could particularly use, which is upgraded, a high-performance desktop, and the pricing on that, uh, similar as you see, Dell list, catalog list price is 3800 if you had to go to Dell.com, 2,428, the MTA gets it at a price of 1,565. I think you are uh, validating my grandmother's often uh, uh, concern to, or not ca caution to never pay retail. So uh, I guess avoiding the left-hand column would be the smart move. Okay. All right. We've got your uh, motion or your uh, request. Can I have a motion to approve these three? Thank you. Second. Second. Any final questions? Yes, ma'am. Please, Lisa. Yes, uh, it, yes. Includes, it includes all three. Please, go ahead. Okay. So I'm a big advocate for the minority business, and I see that on this summary, it says that they are not, <clears throat> excuse me, assigned 0% of the goal because they can't find anybody. Is anybody reading that correctly? Contract due to insufficient availability of minority women-owned businesses. Yes, correct. That's what it says. So typically what happens with these, these professional services, it's actually difficult to subcontract where they have these actuary consultants that they employ. So what we do is we look at also the diversity content with that particular firm mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to a subcontract where then it would subcontract, but, you know, the, the, it's... It, it would be difficult to find highly specialized 
actuarial uh, subcontracting opportunities. Okay. Thank you. I think what Lisa is suggesting is that whomever is the, the driver of said uh, contract, they should go look harder because this period of term deserves some excess. And I don't think it's acceptable to say there's no one. It's a very fair point, Lisa. Thank yeah. you for saying that. Thank you. All right. Uh, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions. Okay. Thank motion you. passes. Thank you, Chair. Um, next is a one-year renewal of a miscellaneous procurement contract for the MTA's existing Bentley Systems Asset Management software as a service uh, cloud subscription, which provides for cloud hosting, software maintenance and support in the not to exceed amount of $2,314,000. This is related to the, our enterprise asset management and is critical in terms of having the functionality with regard to our on, um, you know, our on cloud subscription services. The next, for the next item, um, an emergency declaration request was made by the MTA Chief Technology Officer for the ratification of a services contract awarded to Sky Power Solutions in the estimated amount of $5 million to provide engineering analysis at various MTA critical IT facilities throughout the New York Metro. <coughs> the last item is a retroactive change order to add an additional $4 million to the contract with Goldman Sachs and, and company LLC for financial advisory services in support of a public-private partnership procurement through the Rapid Station Accessibility Upgrade Program, allowing Goldman Sachs to perform the phase two work. I ask for approval of these items. Sir, I'm talking to the former Goldman Sachs employee here. Which I, I'm recused. <laughs> Just to, since you're J jokingly raising that yeah. this this re this relationship with Goldman Sachs, which was in support of the P the P three the public private partnership on the stations project, long predates Kevin's employment. Absolutely, absolutely. I was I was just joking. Just we were just. I submit yeah. these items for your approval. All right. Any questions on any of these three? Motion, second. Second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we have some consolidated financial materials as we do. Uh, those are on pages 63 to 115. Are there any questions on the consolidated financials? Hearing none. All right, thank you very much uh, for staying a little longer today. Appreciate the intense uh, conversation and participation. Uh, can I have a motion to adjourn, please? Second. Thank you very much. All right, see you guys on Wednesday.